Let me uh, start recording this. I'm sure more people will come on it, but we are a little bit tw past the uh, 1210. So let's just get started. All right. So um, we are moving on. We are now, of course, in the second half of the class. Um, and so the first work we'll be looking at is the book um, Eros and Civilization by uh, Herbert Marcuse. I've heard that name pronounced many, many different ways, um, but the way it was always explained to me or, or, or said to me was Marcuse. Some people call, call him Marcus, some people call him Marcuse. Uh, as far as I know, the correct pronunciation is Marcuse, uh, who is, of course, another one of these, you know, Frankfurt School intellectuals. Um, and the reason why I selected this book, not only the fact that, you know, Marcuse was one of the most prominent figures in this group, but this book really serves as a good sort of overview, I think, of Freudian theory. And Freud is something we haven't really talked about too much in class so far. Let me, uh, in fact, get this thing started. <clears throat> More people are coming in. So, this down here. I haven't done this in a week. All right, anyway. So, yeah, up until now, we haven't really talked too much about, about Freud. Um, but I did mention, you know, I think at least at the beginning of class, you know, at the beginning of the semester, that one of the distinctive aspects of critical theory is this sort of marriage of, you know, Freud with Marx, which in many ways kind of makes it distinct from other. Uh, sort of non-Freudian approaches to Marxism, and of course makes it distinct from other approaches to psychoanalysis and psychology, uh, which of course not many people you know share that kind of Marxist uh, orientation to it. So, so I think it provides a pretty good overview of it. Now, Marcuse is not the only thinker to really you know incorporate you know Freudian theory into his own you know approach to Marxism. Um, most of the critical theorists do so. It's just that we, we haven't really had much occasion to really cover that. Um, you see it a little bit, I think, though, in, in, in books like um, Dialectic of Enlightenment. There are references here and there. Um, Adorno, whose you know, background, of course, was in music and philosophy, as I've mentioned, um, was so, um, I, you know, well read, I guess, with Freud, that he was able to basically to, to fool people in, in, in the United States into thinking that he was a psychologist, basically. And I think if, if you look at some of the you know, projects which Adorno was attached to in the 1940s um, here in the United States, that, that he's often listed as a psychologist, including probably one of his most well-known works, um, a, 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 a work known as the Authoritarian personality, which is, which is a pretty interesting work. It's, it's basically an attempt to sort of look at the psychological or social psychological basis of fascism. And in fact, was part of a much larger work, I believe known as the Studies in Prejudice, which is made up of multiple volumes. The Authoritarian Personality, I believe was volume four. Um, you know, we won't maybe make some reference to it, but we won't cover that too much in this class, at least. So it is something, you know, interesting if, if, if you want to read further into it. Um, again, suffice to say, you know, Adorno was essentially able to fool, you know, many people in the United States into thinking that he, in fact, was a psychologist when he was not. Like I said, his background basically being in uh, music and philosophy. Um, Marcuse also sort of, you know, takes up this approach. And like I said, I think this book mainly works as a, you know, give, gives you a good overview uh, to Freudian theory, which we'll try, try to cover. So... <clears throat> Um, I'd like to actually first switch gears a little bit. It looks like most people are, are here now. So um, I'd actually like to switch over to the text itself because I want to read a little bit from the so-called political preface of 1966. So this book is written in the 1950s. It's, it's, it's published in 1955, actually. Um, and really in less than 10 years, um, with the publication of Marcuse's other big important book uh, uh, known as um, One Dimensional Man, which comes out in 1964, Marcuse kind of switches gears a little bit and actually sort of moves away from this sort of earlier theory that he works out in this book here. Um, still with the Freudian stuff, you know, you, 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 you can definitely see the Freudian influences here, but he sort of takes his theory in a much different direction, actually. 
And this, to some extent, is summarized here in this political preface written in 1966, which pretty much encapsulates the, the, the argument that he develops in the book, One Dimensional Man, which again, like I said, is written in 1964. Um, so I'll just read the first uh, you know, paragraph or so. It's a little bit too long to put into a slide, so I thought I would just read it out like this. Um, and, and you know, by the way, you know, if, if if you haven't read this, you know, you should. Um, I I think I just on the syllabus I put part. You know, I, I broke this book up into part one, part two. This is basically the, the PDF file that covers part one. Um, I know when I was a student, I wouldn't read one extra page if if I did not have to. Uh, I didn't really specify it, but it, yeah, I mean, if if you haven't already, you, you should read this because I think it does, uh, in many ways, update his theory a little bit more. And I think. Although the argument that he sets forward here in this book from the 1950s is, is still relevant today, I think you'll see that, that, that his sort of subsequent work, I think is even maybe more relevant, at least in some aspects. So anyway, let me just read it right here. He says, um, Eros and Civilization, obviously the title of this book. Um, the title expressed an optimistic, euphemistic, even positive thought, namely that the achievements of advanced industrial Society would enable man to reverse the direction of progress, to break the fatal union of productivity and destruction, liberty and repression. In other words, to learn the gay science, Gaia Scientia, which is actually a reference to Nietzsche, also known as the uh, joyful wisdom uh, of how to use the social wealth for shaping man's world in accordance with his life instincts in the concerted struggle against the purveyors of death. So if you've already read ahead and 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 familiarize yourself somewhat with this text and with the Freudian theory that underlies this text. You know there's a lot of talk about these so-called life instincts and death instincts, which of course we'll get into a little bit more. But let me go on from here. Um, this optimism was based on the assumption that the rationale for the continued acceptance of domination no longer prevailed, that scarcity and the need for toil were only artificially perpetuated in the interest of preserving the system of domination. I neglected or minimized the fact that this obsolescent rationale had been vastly strengthened, if not replaced by even more efficient forms of social control. So this reference to even more efficient forms of social control is, is, is kind of the argument that he works out in his later work, in, 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 basically in his work from the 1960s. What he's talking about here in, the, you know, in this book written in the 1950s is this idea that essentially people are repressed sexually and otherwise uh, in, 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 in the interest of producing profit. So in that sort of simple thesis, I think you can already see, you know, quite clearly the, 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 the sort of marriage of Marx and Freud. So you see the Freudian aspect, the repression of sexuality, um, and then you see the Marxist aspect in the name of, of producing profit. I mean, that's essentially the, the argument that he works up here. In, in this book, Eros and Civilization. The people are repressed, not for any you know, moral purpose or anything like that, but simply for the, for the interest of producing profit. To be a more productive employee requires you to basically repress yourself. And, 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 you know, and these forms of repression are, are in many ways you know, foisted upon people. But the people are repressed in a way which is meant to channel their, their energy, uh, essentially, into more productive work. Um, and that's so much so that people have become so repressed, in fact, that it's actually making them destructive, <laughs> that their, their so-called life instincts have become so weakened that the, that the death instincts, as he says, are taking over and that people are becoming destructive, both to themselves and to other people as well. That's, that's in a nutshell, basically, the argument that he works out here in this book in the 1950s. And again, I think it's still very relevant. I, I, I mainly selected the, the, this book, though, because I think it does give you a good overview of Freudian theory, which, again, is something we haven't really talked about as much. But as I'm sort of you know, hinting at here, I, I, I do think his later theory, which kind of moves in a very different direction, I think, is a, maybe in some ways more relevant. But let, but let me get to this. So, so what does he mean here by these more efficient forms of social control? Uh, the very forces which rendered society capable of pacifying the struggle for existence serve to repress in the individuals uh, the need for such a liberation, where the high standard of living does not suffice for reconciling the people with their life and their rulers, the social engineering of the soul, and, and the science of human 
relations provide the necessary libidinal cathexis, meaning like a, like a catharsis, basically, uh, uh, an, an, an outlet for your libido, basically. In the affluent society, the authorities are hardly forced to justify their dominion. They deliver the goods. They satisfy the sexual and the aggressive energy of their subjects. Like the unconscious, the destructive power which they, of which they so successfully represent, they are this side of good and evil, and the principle of contradiction has no place in their logic. Okay, so let me move back here. Uh, I have something in the chat. My friend was telling me to read this book yesterday. Uh, which one, Eros or One Dimensional Man? Uh, <clears throat> Eros and, well, he was talking about Marcuse and like uh, Cathexis and all of that stuff, um, but Eros and Civilization. Yeah, well, it, it, is, it is a good book. It is, um, again, very much a, a, you know, I think a good overview of Freudian theory. I think he, he actually kind of moves away from the argument he puts forward here in, in this book, you know, this 1950s book, to a different idea, which he calls in, in, in um, One Dimensional Man, he terms it repressive desublimation. So I'll, I'll try to explain what this means. Sublimation, again, is a Freudian term. For, uh, sublimation is basically Freud's term for how we repress ourselves and basically, again, sort of channel our libidinal energy into other pursuits. It's not necessarily a bad thing in and of itself, um, Freud would argue that this is how any kind of, you know, artistic or creative endeavor or, or really almost anything produced by humanity is made possible. This, this, uh, essentially channeling this, this, this energy into, into, dif into different outlets. So again, in Eros, Marcuse makes the argument that people have become too repressed, basically, and that this repression serves, again, like I said, the, the interest of basically producing profit. Now, you know, I think as a document of 1950s America, I think this works pretty well as, you know, a historical artifact from that period of time, which was, you know, I, I think everyone kind of has a sense of, you know, American history that the 1950s were a much more repressive period of time, but that a lot of those social values began to change in the 1960s. And, and, it's, and it's really Marcuse's later work, which I think is more relevant in that in that regard which i haven't really gone into much as of yet um but as far as this idea that people are too repressed and that this repression is actually making them destructive you know i think is still relevant at least in certain aspects of society particularly within you know since we're talking you know especially about sexual repression here especially among what we would call the christian right here in this country um, or, or, you know, frankly, any sort of, you know, fundamentalist, you know, approach to religion, whatever it may be. Um, but since we're mostly talking in an American context, and Marcuse, by the way, I, I, I should also mention, did stay behind in the United States after, after World War II, when many of the other people went back, like Adorno and, and, and Horkheimer uh, actually eventually went, went back to Germany after the war and became sort of prominent figures in German, you know, society. Um, Marcuse actually stayed behind and taught in, in, in the United States. I uh, was very influential in, 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 in the counterculture of the 1960s, had many, you know, sort of prominent students, probably most well-known perhaps being um, Angela Davis, who was very big in the Black Power movement, is still, is still around today, in fact. So, yeah, I mean, Marcuse's work does, I think, fit maybe better in the context of American society. Obviously, he's not just talking about the 1950s, but, but, but basically, you know, the history of repression, you know, for centuries, you know, before that even as well. But, but as a sort of document of sort of 1950s America, I think it works very well. And again, I still think you see um, elements of what he's talking about basically still, you know, um, displayed today, basically, by the so-called religious right or the Christian right here in this country, who I think, you know, I think it's fairly obvious to say are, you know, horribly repressed people and sort of want to inflict their repressive morality on other people as well, whether it's, you know, on same-sex marriage, um, you know, sex outside of procreation, abortion, all these things basically sort of fit into that to some extent or another.
Um, and the other idea, the idea that people become so repressed that they become destructive. Essentially, what, what, what he's saying that they become so in incapable, basically, of enjoying life that it makes them almost have like a death wish and makes them, again, sort of exhibit destructive uh, tendencies both towards themselves and to other, other people. You, you know, this idea that there is a death instinct that operates in human psychology is a controversial idea, even among, you know, adherents of Freudian psychology. And it may sound far-fetched as first, far-fetched at first, but consider, you know, the stances of the Christian right and maybe conservatives, more generally speaking, consider their opinions on things like climate change, which is the most, you know, pressing struggle that the human species probably faces as, as a whole, you know, the, the possible end of human life on this planet, not life in general, right, as George Carlin, you know, used to say, right, you know, you know, the, you know, the planet's not going anywhere, we are, <laughs> you know, we're, we're the ones that are going to get wiped out, the, you know, the planet will keep on going long after we're gone. But the most pressing, you know, concern maybe of human life on this planet is dealing with climate change. And these people literally do everything that they can in their power to sabotage, you know, any efforts to, to, to the point of even denying the existence of it. And you consider that, you, you consider their warmongering, their, their willingness to start wars, their uh, fetishization of firearms and guns and things like that. And maybe on other things as well, it's, it's, it's maybe not that hard, hard, you know, far, far fetched to believe that maybe these people do have a kind of like a death wish, basically. Uh, does somebody have their hand up? Uh, Kyan? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say two quick things. Um, I also think that like uh, the repressive desublimation um, can be seen in um, like the medical, the mental health industry uh, when it comes to like therapy and um, psychiatric drugs. Mm -hmm. um you know yeah. uh, when somebody has an actual problem with the system and they speak out uh they're the ones seen you know they're seemed as insane because the premise on which the other person is perceiving them is completely backwards yeah um yeah and also i just want to say um there's a guy a christian um commentator his name is milo yanopoulos i've heard of him yeah yeah and um he was like a really proudly gay atheist conservative for like 30 40 years and like he said he went through gay conversion therapy <laughs> and is now a christian man and i just wanted to say that because like the conservatives are just so uh stuck on the past i mean it's that's what conservative means but yeah 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 it does and again i mean to to the extent that i mean even the term conservative though might be even a little misleading because it does at least imply that they want to preserve life or, or, or hold on to some way of life. If you sort of take the Marcuse argument to its furthest point, you know, basically it, what, what calls itself the modern day conservative movement is again, they, they, these people who, you know, want to die basically that they have this, you know, like death wish that they are trying to inflict on themselves and other people. Uh, did you have your hand up again? Uh, yeah also because um, what's going on with critical race theory it's funny because like if they do want to uphold conservative values then why do they not want to talk about it in the first place <laughs> right they don't want to talk about the past. they don't want to talk about the history of what the conservative leaders did so they right. want to do that so it's like well because they, they have this I, idealized vision of, you know, American history and they can't, you know, they can't handle something that, you know, goes against that. I actually have a good, a good video. It's good that you point that out that I'll send out after class um, by this economist, Richard Wolf, who, who I tend to listen to fairly often and sort of, you know, explaining the relations of uh, critical theory and critical race theory. So that's good. I'll, 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 I'll send that link out uh, after class, but um you know, I mean, if, if you look at, again, with the Christian right, I mean, if, if you've ever heard of the, the, this concept of, you know, the rapture that, that they have, this, this, this end time, I mean, they're, they're pretty explicit if you actually listen to them. They, they, they are like longing for the end of the world. They literally are. They want to go up to heaven and, you know, they want to leave this horrible, sinful world behind them. So it's not even that hidden. I mean, it's actually fairly explicit if you, if you actually listen to a lot of these, you know, really hardcore, uh, you know, Christian conservatives talk. Um, even their support of Israel, many, you know, a lot of that, you know, I mean, I mean, there's a very long history of, um, of, um, 
anti-Semitism, you know, uh, for, from, from Christians against Jewish people. This, the, this term Judeo-Christian is, you know, I mean, you know, it was invented like last Thursday or something like that. I mean, not, not really, but I mean, it's, it's something of very recent, or, you know, recent origin. There, there, there's not this long-standing history of, you know, Christians and Jews being on the same page with each other. Quite the opposite, in fact. The modern day, you know, sort of stance of a lot of Christian conservatives and their support of Israel stems from the fact that they, that they believe this is some sort of precondition for bringing about Armageddon, which apparently is a, an, you know, an actual place. In Palestine, right, and 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 then, well, of, of course, where where the prophecy, you know, end end of the world or the final, you know, battle between good and evil or whatever, is supposed to take is supposed to take place. So, th so their strong support of Israel actually stems from their belief that this is somehow, you know, helping them bring about the end of the world. So they're quite explicit about this, and and even if they weren't, I would say that their, you know, positions on all these issues from climate change to you know to uh, firearms and things like that, basically all reveal these tendencies, even, even if they weren't being, ex, you know, explicit about it. Um, of course, you know, the, the Supreme Court in, in this country current, you know, has a majority of people that basically, you know, think, think this way as well. So it is something to be concerned with. Now, the other idea of repressive desublimation, de which Marcuse really develops more in his later work, his work from, from the 1960s, is a, is a little bit different, or I would say a, a, a lot different. It's not, it's not this sort of, older idea of we repress people so that they become a good productive employee. What repressive desublimation means is that you allow for actually a limited amount of sexual and aggressive gratification, both, both aspects of it, right? Our, our, our sexual impulses and our aggressive impulses, which he would argue, again, in line with Freudian theory are both sort of an intrinsic part of people that you will actually allow for a very limited gratification of those things, but in a way which sort of ties people into the social system, which if you think about, if you think about American society from the 1960s on seems to more or less, you know, m match up with um, how American society has changed since then, right? We're, we're not as repressed, you know, generally speaking, as we were in the 1950s. That th those tendencies do linger on in some groups, which I'm calling basically, you know, the Christian right. Um, but they're not as you know mainstream as as they once were, and I think most of American society has more gone, has gone more in this other um, direction. Of um, yeah, we'll we'll sort of loosen up some of the sexual prohibitions and you know censorship and things like that. We'll allow for a little more you know sexual content on TV and and and, and violence in movies and things like that. But but in, in in a way which again is is meant to sort of tie people to to the system, to this, you know, political and economic system, which still alienates people. So, so again, the Marxist idea of alienation still looms very large in this analysis. People are still alienated. Their, 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 you know, maybe more basic needs are still going unfulfilled. Um, especially in the United States, we still deny people, you know, basic rights like healthcare and education and things like that. And I got to say, I mean, reading, Marcuse, I mean, it's 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 kind of funny almost. I mean, he he really does sort of make you feel like people are kind of pathetic, because I mean that's essentially what 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 he's saying. The, the, the people will will put up with alienation, they'll they'll put up with a lack of basic human rights, essentially in exchange for you know boobs on TV and um, you know allowing people to drive big you know aggressive loud cars and you know like things like that, or, or allow people to you know hoard firearms you know which is another aspect of it. i mean and, and and it's funny then to sort of like look at well how how are these things sort of um you know how are these impulses kind of gratified i say bo boobs on television I'm, I'm you know i'm making a joke about it obviously i mean there probably is a a slight you know tendency to to you know cater more towards a male audience than a female audience but there is a lot of you know exploitation of of, of the male body as well and, and, and really, you know, the point isn't what portion of the anatomy is being featured. Kind of the real point here is that it's on TV, you know, and which, of course, is suggesting that you're not even really getting any real gratification out of this. It's all vicarious. It's all sort of a simulation of things. But people will sort of accept that. They'll, 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 they'll sort of take this sort of vicarious compensation for things and, again, basically put up with a society which which doesn't fulfill their 
more basic needs or, 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 or you know, fulfills even more important needs that people might have. And, you know, again, I mean, we do allow for, you know, to, to a limited extent, a, a little more, you know, sexual gratification than we did, you know, say in the 1950s. From what I understand, at least, you know, American society is still, you know, even now probably much more repressed than certain European countries, maybe like France or Italy or, or you know, maybe other places as, as well. But again, relative to, to the 1950s, we, we do allow for a little more where we are, you know, a little more openness with sexuality. We're not as blatantly homophobic as a society as we once were, things like that. Um, what about the aggressive impulses? You know, how does society allow for, for, for satisfaction of our aggressive impulses, which are, which are just as important as the sexual ones? I mean, I mean, guns are a pretty obvious example. I would say, right? I mean, I mean, there are literally more, you know, firearms in this country than than there are people. I was I was reading up on it. I mean, there there's about I think 390 million firearms in the United States. There's only about 330 million people, so there literally are more guns than people in in this country. Um, what you know purpose the, the, does that serve other than to allowing you know some sort of you know uh, outlet for people's aggressive impulses, basically? But I would say, you know, maybe next to that, probably the most important sort of outlet for that are probably cars, which I kind of, you know, alluded to before. I mean, the American automotive industry is designed to, you know, I, I mean, I mean, obviously the, the purpose of cars are, are, to, are to provide, you know, a means of transportation for people. But it's sort of secondary aspect, it's secondary purpose is, I think, to allow, uh, again, people to sort of, you know, uh, 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 an outlet for their aggressive impulses. I mean, why do we, why do we even have, you know, horns in, in cars? Have you ever used your, your car horn for anything other than venting frustration at other people on, on the road? Yes, uh, Kai? Uh, yeah, I was actually speaking about this with my friend yesterday about like trains versus cars and like how, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't like, a bunch of car companies lobbied the federal government into making roads yeah so they could sell cars to people but the roads were built by our money so like yeah. we were like we like basically paid to be trapped in cars like yeah basically and, and, uh, and i mean yeah sorry well i was gonna say and gas burning cars as well you know we could have had yeah cars. and our transportation system in this country is terrible it is, especially in this in this area where you know everything's very old. You know the infrastructure is very old. Um, but yeah, I mean that that is in fact true. Yes, the the auto companies lobbied the government to build roads. Um, in 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 many cases, from what I've read, you know even bought up like public transportation, like trolley cars and things like that. They used to have in cities, put them out of business. Did did everything that that they could basically to downgrade or downsize public transportation in this country in yeah so basically everyone could have a car or everyone could more or less be forced to have a car at least if you live in some cities um new york being one of them you know you can still kind of get around walking around i, I would say that that's not even probably true with you know most cities though because uh, they've been redesigned in in a, in a way even to, to, to cater more towards you know vehicular traffic than walking but, you know, New York maybe is one of the last, you know, really cities you can, you know, still kind of walk around in, maybe a few others. Um, but, you know, certainly if you live in, you know, sub suburban areas or in rural areas, you know, you, you pretty much need a car to get around. Um, and again, gas, gas burning cars as well. I mean, I mean, the technology for electric cars has existed basically as long as the technology has existed for gasoline burning cars, basically since like the 1890s. But it's interesting, you know, and, and, and here, you know, the role of the oil, oil companies play a role as well. So you see, you know, the oil companies doing their thing, the oil companies doing their thing to leverage things to work out in, the, in their favor. Um, but beyond that, yeah, I, I mean, I would say, you know, I, I think it's interesting to, um, you know, uh, you know, look at how, how do people allow, you know, or, 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 or to what means do automobiles allow people to sort of vent their aggression? Car horns. Um, I, I mean, I gotta say, you know, I'm, I'm sorry if this makes you sound like, you know, the old man here, but I, I, I can't stand people to have those like loud, loud ass, like mufflers on their cars and things like that. I never did like it, but now, especially as like a father, I mean, I, I hear somebody driving up my street probably like two or three times 
a day, almost every every day. And on numerous occasions, they've actually, you know, woken woken my daughter up from like, you know, like a nap and stuff. So it's it's pretty obnoxious. And I don't see any purpose for it other than to, again, just allow people some sort of outlet for their aggressive impulses. And, you know, besides that, then you have these big oversized cars, American, you know, autos in particular have, have always kind of catered towards that. The big Cadillacs of the 1950s now, of course, it's like um, SUVs and, th- and things like that. And, and there are different sizes of SUVs as well. Some are a little more moderate, but some are just, you know, incredibly large and unnecessary blasting music you know I, I, again i know i sound like you know like the old man here but i mean i think it's pretty obvious though that 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 kind of is the purpose of a lot of cars is that is that you know a, a far a far beyond just a, a simple means of transportation it really does allow people to gratify their aggressive impulses and people take it right you know again people people would rather do that you know they, they'd rather drive around a big loud car and again watch uh um nudity on television or something like that, then have like healthcare or have, uh, you know, be free of student loan debt or something like that, or, you know, live, live in a country that wasn't constantly on the brink of war might be nice as well, or do something about climate change. So, you know, Marcuse does, he really does, I think more than almost all these other thinkers really kind of make you feel like people are kind of pathetic sometimes that, that they're willing to, you know, accept that. Now, I'll say also though that I, I don't necessarily agree with him a hundred percent on everything either. I think maybe he's a little too pessimistic sometimes, but I, I you know I think there's some truth to what he's saying. Obviously, I mean, does anyone else want to uh, try in on this? I mean, what what are some other ways in which society allows for that uh, sexual gratification, uh, aggressive impulses, you know, things like that? I mean, I, I mentioned guns, which are obviously a big issue in this country. I think cars really, you know, provide for that for a, to a large extent. Are there other ways in which we, we allow people to sort of vent these impulses a little bit in, in a way which kind of ties them into the system more? I guess a lot of professional sports fills that role as well. You know, you see also in, you know, fairly recent years, you know, the popularity of mixed martial arts and the UFC and all that other stuff. I mean, that's certainly more... Uh, aggressive than you know boxing, and there and there, and there are people that get mad at boxing fights, right? If 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 or boxing matches, if you know both both boxes aren't like you know like a bloody mess at you know the end of the fight. Uh, yeah, kind. Wait, uh, the question was um like what are other examples? Yeah, how else do we allow people to you know an outlet for their aggression? Um, we tell them that if they go to school, they'll get a job. <laughs> Well, well, um, I mean, that's we, I mean, we, I, mean I, I was gonna say, what, oh man, I forgot. But what I mean by that is basically it's the illusion of like, oh, the stock market, right? Because, like, I don't know um, if you're on Instagram or like social media, but like a lot of people push like the stock market as like a way to financial freedom, yeah, when they don't realize that you know 95% of the stock is owned by like the one percent but what i mean by education is that like if someone is angry that they see somebody you know they see like an artist who has millions of dollars driving a nice car they'll get angry because they see something that they want that they don't have and then they'll be told that the only way to do it is to sublimate their energy and get a degree that's what i meant yeah sure i mean it also definitely serves as you know a means of competition between people, you know, competing for these top academic spots and things like that. Um, as far as the stock market goes, I mean, look how, look how stockbrokers talk, you know, you, you would think they're like, uh, you know, Conan the Barbarian by, by the way they talk about conquest and, you know, things like that. I mean, they're a bunch of guys in suits, you know. Yeah. And when Trump was, um, he was always saying, oh, the stock market is the highest it's ever been as if the whole country was receiving the benefits of that. Right. When it's basically, like you said, like the top you know, like the people on top, um, shooting ranges. Yeah. I mean, I mean the, the way, again, we, we sort of cater towards gun ownership in, in this country. I mean, I mean, Americans own, I think Americans uh, uh, account for almost like half of all gun ownership in, in the entire world, you know, almost half of all the guns in the world basically are in the United States. And again, there are actually, I've always heard people say that. So I was, I was curious to kind of fact check it, but there, there actually are more guns in this country 
than there are people. Again, about 390 million guns to about 330 million people. Uh, yeah, Kai? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, don't we also make the most guns in the world? I mean, is oh, that yeah. like our, one of our largest exports? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, we arm the whole world. We arm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's how we make money. So. Yeah, so we are, we are, you know, literally merchants of death is a term that comes out of the first world war but yeah we go around arming arming the whole world basically or at least you know countries like saudi arabia and israel and stuff and colombia and you know countries that essentially do 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 our bidding in, in those parts of the world um so you know it'd be interesting to talk about that more i mean yeah cars i i, I gotta admit you know as, as somebody who grew up in northern new jersey and has always been around the sort of car car culture and stuff it is something that kind of you know, i have a personal axe axe to grind about i haven't seen too many guns i mean there are a lot of guns i i haven't known too many people that own guns i know a few they don't go around you know carrying them around with them all the time and stuff which people apparently do in other 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 states um but yeah i think those would obviously be sort of like your two go-to examples maybe for how we allow people to you know satisfy their aggressive impulses but again uh, in in a way which sort of keeps them tied into the system which continues to alienate people which continues to you know again deny people basic human rights you know especially here in the united states so the other aspect of it is what marcuse terms the affluent society and i think that this is a term that hasn't aged particularly well uh, so Marcuse has, you know, uh, another essay, I think, written in 1967 called Liberation from the Affluent Society, which, again, is sort of like a, a sort of a, also sort of um, revisiting these these themes as well. So his, I, you know, so his thing is that, yes, in the 1960s and 1960s America, which is still sort of riding high from post-war, you know, American prosperity and things like that, America is, for some, an affluent society, you know, for your basically hetero white male majority. Um, if you're not hetero, you know, as long as you stay in the closet, you know, you're you're okay. Obviously, for black people, that's not true. Women may, sh- you know, white women may share in that prosperity to a certain extent, but you know, also obviously subordinated to their husbands. You know, this is obviously the society of 1950s. You know, even going into the 1960s, captured, I would say, very, you know, almost perfectly in, in you know tv shows like mad men for example if you've never seen that seen that show um and uh where's i going with that so oh yeah so so what, what has happened though of, of course is that obviously affluence in in this country is much more restricted now than it was in the 1960s there are some affluent people still around obviously but but that sort of circle of affluence has become much more limited much much more narrow um than it was in the 1960s but that but that's kind of the sort of key to what marcuse is talking about right so so this combination of affluence and a sort of limited gratification of sexual and aggressive impulses you know essentially ties people into a system which still in 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 the most you know fundamental aspects keeps them unfree basically or, or or perpetuates their um alienation now i don't think that's you know that idea has aged particularly well. I mean, Americans are much less affluent than they were in the 1960s. However, I think you can still sort of, you know, play around this idea. And I think it still has relevance, right? Because you you could then sort of work a theory out of that, which is that as affluence declines in this country, at least in, you know, in terms of the number of people who who get to sort of enjoy the so-called affluent lifestyle, you know, affluent basically means like, you know, like wealthy, basically material abundance, all their material needs are more or less taken care of for the most part. So as that, you know, level of affluence declines, as people are, you know, faced with a, you know, obscene profit-driven healthcare system, as they're increasingly in debt, as their living standards go down, um, could it be then that people will tend to compensate even more with the sexual and the aggressive gratifications that they're still able to get out of out of society. Looked at in those terms, I think it's interesting because if you if you look at American society since like say like the 1980s and onwards, that seems to be the case, right? I mean, affluence has declined in the country, but the, uh, the level of sexual and aggressive gratification people are, are able to get has increased even more since the 1960s. So could it be then that that would then continue to sort of keep people sort of plugged into the system, essentially plugged into the matrix, if you understand the reference, um, even even with you know a society that again denies them their most 
you know, important needs. And, and, and then, you know, projecting that into, into the future, what, what would happen there? I mean, I mean if, if affluence continues to, to decline even more, and I don't think there's any real indication to suggest that that trend is going to change anytime soon, um, it would mean that people would have to find even greater means of compensation through basically sex and violence, right? I mean, that's essentially what he's talking about, right? So how would that sort of play itself out? Legalization of prostitution? It's a possibility. I mean, there are indications that that has happened. That has already sort of happened in certain parts of the country. It could happen throughout other parts of the country as well. Um, some sort of virtual reality sex simulator or something like that. I mean, that's also a possibility as, as well. It sounds like something out of a sci-fi novel or movie, but I mean, there's, you know, who knows? I mean, we, we, we could very well see something like that happen in our lifetime. And, and other things as well. Um, now, as far as gratifying aggressive impulses, I mean, I don't know what else you could do other than, you know, legalizing murder <laughs> or something like that, or, you know, of some sort of purge. You know, I, I mean, I've never seen any of those movies, The Purge, but um, I, I know the premise of it. I mean, th th that's essentially kind of what people are talking about, right? Or that's essentially the idea, you know, behind movies like that as well, I think. Uh, yeah, kind. Um, I, I, I did see like psychiatric stuff, but like just drug addiction in general. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I personally think all, I mean, most drugs should be legalized because of other reasons, but uh, drug addiction is definitely going to rise. Yeah, sure. Certainly. Um, and again, it's just, it's just another coping, right? It's just another way of, you know, compensating for a, you know, fairly brutal society, which, you know, alienates people and, and, you know, denies them, you know, basic rights. Um, as well as, you know, both so-called illegal drugs, which are, you're right, are, are, you know, becoming more legalized, but also, you know, pharmaceutical drugs as, as well. Um, and, 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 and there, there's this very strong, you know, taboo in this country, I would say, especially about, you know, so sort of like not, not being happy, right? That well, well, no matter how bad objectively, you know, social conditions are, everyone has to have like a smile on their face, basically 24 seven. And, you know, if you don't, you're, you know, labeled as being negative or something like that. You also see, you know, the, the rise of self-help books and things like that. This, this sort of, you know, the, 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 the power of positive thinking, which I think like Oprah Winfrey was a big advocate of at one point or probably still is. Um, all, all the stuff about positive thinking, you know, is, is, is very, it's actually very sinister because it sounds very wholesome and uplifting and things like that. But sort of the hidden implication of it, though, of course, is that people who do not succeed in life that, you know, it's basically your own fault. They all, you know, if only you were a, a little more positive, right? If you're only you were more a little uplifting in your own thinking, that things would have turned out better for you. Not that you're living in a world where, you know, jobs are being out outsourced over overseas and wealthy people have, you know, completely rigged the economy to benefit them. And, you know, politicians don't do anything to, you know, intervene in that to any extent. Not that those, you know, objective social processes are, are ongoing and getting worse. But it's simply your, your, your own fault that you're not a positive enough, you know, person and things like that. And, and you know, psychiatry does obviously play a big, a big, a big role in that. And, and, and Marcuse does have, uh, you know, some, some comments, some negative comments about what he refers to as the neo-Freudians. And the neo-Freudians basically make up, you know, I guess the psychiatric, you know, mainstream um, in this country and, and, and elsewhere. So, you know, it's a very interesting idea. This idea of repressive desublimation. Again, desublimation being that we're, we're not going to repress our sexual and aggressive impulses as much, but we're going to allow for a very limited gratification of those things, but in, in, in a way which keeps people sort of plugged into a society which, you know, doesn't meet their more basic needs, basic human rights, healthcare, education, you know, living in a more beneficial social environment with with other people and things like that so that's where marcuse goes to um we're, we're going to sort of you know work a little bit backwards to his his earlier theory which, which again i still i still think gives you a pretty good overview of of you know freudian theory so i think that's important here as well you know adorno by the way also sort of you know i think you know keys into this idea of repressive desublimation when he refers to the uh culture industry, right? He, he, he says it's both pornographic and prudish at the same time. Now he's writing that in the 1940s. So if anything, I think he has even better insight 
into the way in which culture is, you know, shaping up to be in the United States, which is right. It, it's, it's pornographic in the sense that, uh, again, it allows you a limited gratification, but it's prudish also at the same time because it denies true satisfaction as well. It's, 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 it's like I said, it's all just on television, basically. It's all vicarious. It's all a simulation without actual, you know, satisfaction, basically. To quote, you know, to quote the Rolling Stones. Um, anyway, so this is also from his preface. Um, and he talks about basically, you know, how he sees, you know, by being sort of, you know, adhering to, to the sort of the Marxist analysis of society leads one into sort of embracing the, what was then, I guess, re referred to as these, you know, third world revolutionary movements. Which of course in the 1960s were going on in Vietnam and in various other places, but of course you know mostly you know this is in 1966, so the Vietnam War is very much in full swing at, at, at this time. Uh, so he says here, when in the more or less affluent societies, again talking about the United States, productivity has reached a level at which the masses participate in its benefits, and he's, of course he's talking about working class people here as well, and at which the opposition is effectively and democratically contained then the conflict between master and slave is also effectively contained, or rather it has changed its social location. It exists and explodes in the revolt of the backward countries, meaning again, what people used to refer to as the third world countries, against the intolerable heritage of colonialism and its prolongation by neo-colonialism. The Marxian concept stipulated that only those who were free from the blessings of capitalism could possibly change it into a free society. Those whose existence was the very negation of capitalist property could become the historical agents of liberation. In the international arena, the Marxian concept regains its full validity. So, you know, I think, though, we, we, we can say that this idea has kind of turned out to be a a failure, though. I mean, for the most part, uh, this this idea that these third world revolutionary movements would offer any real alternative to capitalism. I mean, where is that really, you know, turned out to be to be the case? Vietnam, it is true, in spite of the massive devastation inflicted on, on the U.S. by Vietnam, which killed millions of people. Right? It is actually one of the fastest growing, you know, economies in the world today. Um, its economic system very much, you know, resembles that of China in a lot of ways. But is that a real, you know, the, the, the question is, and this is still something that's, you know, debated by many people on the left, is to what extent countries like China and Vietnam can even, you know, consider, still be considered if they ever were socialist, or, or are they in fact just a sort of another version of capitalism? Um, and, and it's sort of an ongoing debate. I mean, I mean, I don't, I don't know if there's any clear answer or resolution for that. And you can kind of make good arguments for both sides, I think, that it's capitalist or that it's still socialist, that it's different enough from, from at least the Western capitalist model to, to you know, still be considered a socialist model. Um, would Cuba be, be the closest country? Well, maybe. I mean, Cuba is a very poor country. Although it's not that much poorer than other countries in the same area, I mean, I, I mean, you know, people often compare like Cuba to like Chile or something like that, which was a very, you know, under the right wing, you know, Pinochet government, you know, implemented a lot of these, you know, pro pro capitalist reforms. And there are lots of things you can point to that would show you that the so called Chilean miracle, economic miracles, is, is exaggerated, but. I, I mean, can you really compare Cuba to Chile? I mean, I mean, Cuba is a small Caribbean country without much industry. Its population is like probably like half half the size of Chile's. Um, it would seem more sense to compare Cuba to other countries in in that area, in that Caribbean region of of the world. And yeah, I mean, it's not that much poorer than any other country in that area. Puerto Rico which is a US territory, you know, the poverty rate in Puerto Rico is about the same as it is in Cuba uh, or the Dominican Republic or Jamaica. Um, and Haiti is actually a lot worse. You know, Haiti is a much poorer, poorer country. So 
Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, isn't that just a consequence of imperialism and colonialism? Well, it's a consequence of imperialism, yes. Uh, of and capitalism, of essentially. Trade embargo against Cuba. It's also a consequence of geography. I mean, we're, we're talking about a small country without a lot of industry. You can't expect it to. Well, know. what about Venezuela? It has well, the Venezuela biggest oil also, reserve I mean, in the world, right? It has, yeah, a lot of oil and, and a lot of its you know, economic system depends on that. I mean, Venezuela was a fairly prosperous country, you know, until the, you know, the sanctions came in. I mean, um, you know, say what you will about the, you know, Chavez government. I mean, yeah. it, it did bring down, oh. bring, bring down the poverty level in that country to, to a large extent. It's, it, it's hard to separate these things because once you, once the U.S. starts sanctioning these countries, I mean, you, you can't underestimate how devastating an impact those sanctions have. So, you know, if you're really confident in your system, you would say, well, I'm not going to sanction this country. I'm going to, you know, trade with it and, and, and we'll just sort of watch the system fall apart from within. But, you know, we, we, we've never actually seen, seen that happen. So, I mean, to what extent is, is, is poverty in those countries a result of, of sanctions? I mean, I, I mean, in other areas, that they do pretty well. I mean, Cuba does very well when it comes to healthcare and literacy rates and education and things like that. Yeah. Uh, do you have a hand up? Oh, uh, I was going to say, um, like how um, the U.S. just seized like all those funds from, um, I think, Afghanistan, right? The, uh, the uh, seized funds from Afghanistan. The, yeah, like they seized like a bunch of oil treasury funds from, I think, Afghanistan or Iraq. And like basically, it was on democracy now, but um, she was, I think, you know, saying that like, a million children are forecasted to die because of that. And it's like, it doesn't matter because no, they don't. the care. U.S. needs money, but at the same time, we're raising oil prices and oil companies are making the most profit at the same time. So it doesn't make any sense. Right. Well, if it's oil, it's probably from Iraq because Iraq has, you know, uh, pretty large oil reserves. But I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, the U.S. has been sanctioning Iraq since the 1990s. Which did very little against Saddam Hussein, obviously, because you know the you know the suffering of you know hundreds of thousands of people probably died as a result of that, in, including children. Um, I was actually supposed to teach a class once on uh, you know s- sanctions, but I never I, I never it, it ended up getting changed in, into something else. I always kind of regret not not doing that because it would be interesting to really you know dive into in, into this topic more and really sort of explore the history of of sanctions and and, and how these things work. And it's kind of like you know, it's almost like it's like false modesty that, that the U.S. assumes where we like, you know, pretend that like even though we're doing these sanctions, that they're not really having like a severe impact on these countries when in actuality they devastate these countries. I mean, I mean, if you look at the countries that have grown the most over the last several years, countries like China, and Japan and things like that, a major part of their economic growth was, of course, being able to trade with the United States. Right. When, when you're not able to do that, that obviously, you know, obviously has a very sort of negative impact on, on the economy of your country but um yeah did you have something else that you want to say uh okay i just want to clarify um i linked the thing in the chat um yeah, I saw it's it. actually even more dystopic uh they're taking seven billion dollars and they're splitting it among the families of the people whose um you know family members died in 9-11 so they're taking seven billion dollars and splitting it up between like a thousand people and most of the people who are like who are the victims like their families are actually disagree with what's going on but we're taking seven billion dollars from uh afghanistan's oil okay. well uh, yeah i mean why not take it from uh, saudi arabia right who actually probably helped you know orchestrate this attack um but yeah i mean i mean no matter who 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 who, who you take it from it's not you know obviously not going to bring bring their families back and things like that um I'll I'll have, to, I'll have to look at it. I'm not, you know, I actually didn't. I, I do watch uh, 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 Democracy Now sometimes, but I haven't seen that story yet. But it's interesting. Um, and yeah, and sort of speaks to this sort of ongoing, you know, imperialism that we have going on in this world, you know, today, which of course the United States is at the heart of. What Mar- Marcuse calls, by the way, neo neocolonialism, which is also sort of an interesting term, right? Because it means that we don't we don't establish direct colonies anymore. The way that the British did, or the way that the French did, in um, Indochina, which included Vietnam. 
but there's a sort of neo-colonial where, where we sort of leave a, you know, in, in, in name only independent government. But in reality, of course, that government is more or less, you know, under, under the control of the United States government, basically does, you know, whatever the United States tells it to do. That's, that's essentially what they're talking about here with neo-colonialism. And of course, the, the, the massive presence of the U.S. military on the world stage, where we have, you know, 800 military bases around the world. We spend more money than the next 10 countries combined, you know, which is an enormous, obviously, drain on resources that, that could be going, you know, to better uses here in, in this country as well. Um, but what Marcuse is also saying here is, is, is sort of like a revision of the earlier theory by Lenin, the earlier theory of imperialism by Lenin, who also kind of argued in a very similar way. So, you know, Marx, of course, always argued that socialism would develop in the most, would, would come about in the most economically developed countries, like the United Kingdom, possibly the, the United States. Um, but that didn't really happen. I mean, I mean, socialism did kind of make some headway in, 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 in many of the European states, you know, after, after World War II. Um, but not, you know, I, I think still far from what, you know, probably Marx had in mind. Um, it was, it was actually Lenin who introduced the idea that socialism would, um, be more realistically achievable in underdeveloped countries. And the reason he he did so, or, or the, the, his his rationale for this argument is, is actually very kind of similar to what Marcuse is saying here, which is essentially that imperialism basically corrupts the working class in these more affluent affluent countries like France and England and the United States, because they're able to sort of benefit to some extent from imperialism in, in, in the form of you know cheaper prices for commodities and things like that, maybe slightly higher wages, but that's enough to essentially you know buy off or again essentially corrupt the working classes of these countries to support the system, to support the capitalist system. And so it was Lenin who introduced this idea that you know socialism would be better off or, or again could be more realistically achieved in underdeveloped countries, including Russia, which was a very underdeveloped country at the time of the Russian Revolution. And Lenin's theory seems to, at least at first glance, ha have, have proven to be more correct in that you do see you know, socialist movements in Cuba, in Vietnam, in China, various other parts of the world. Um, the problem with that, though, is that you know, those countries didn't, you know, again, we, we, we have the advantage of hindsight here. Now we can look back upon even these movements in the 1960s. And I, I, I think fairly, you know, with, with some certainty, you know, conclude that wh whatever they turned into didn't exactly turn into socialism. I mean, Cuba, I mean, I mean, the, the ideology of someone like, you know, like Castro, Ca Castro is probably ultimately more of a kind of nationalist than he is a socialist. I mean, I mean, if, if he had any kind of ideology, it's probably mostly Cuban nationalism. It's just that that position with this kind of anti-imperialistic stance kind of pushed him into more of these socialist camp of the Soviet Union and that and that that alignment of countries than it did the United States, but I, I don't think, uh, at least early on, you know, Castro could be said to be a, a you know hardcore socialist. I think he was more 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 of a nationalist than anything else. And I think I think nationalism was really the undercurrent of a lot of these so-called socialist movements that you see in China, uh, which 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 now you know currently under under Xi Jinping has has sort of you know reverted more to a kind of nationalistic stance, although they, 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 they still talk a lot about Marxism. I don't want to over-exaggerate that also. That's, 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 that's the distorted commentary they hear from a lot of Western people, that, that, that China has basically abandoned Marxism and stuff. It's, it's not reflected in the rhetoric of their leaders, who still talk all the time about Marxism and socialism and stuff, but, but they do also talk a lot about nationalism. Um, and and, and, and I, I think you see that in, in, in other countries as, as well. So, so what Marcuse is offering here is essentially a revision or a, a reboot, if you will, of, of sort of the, the older Leninist idea of imperialism. And, and, and attendant with this is also this you know, very kind of anti-working class stance, at least, at least here in the United States. And I've mentioned this, this, this before as well, and I think this will probably be more of a theme as we go on more in, in the second half of the class, but one of the legacies of critical theory that I think is 
not a positive, you know, legacy of it is, is, is a sort of anti-working class stance. That Marcuse, Horkheimer, Adorno, all these people, you know, Benjamin dies, so we don't really know how his thought would have, you know, developed and stuff. Lukash goes more with the Eastern countries, right, than with the, with the Western countries. And he, he was never really, you know, a, a part of the Frankfurt School anyway. Um, um, but the Frankfurt School, you know, the, these, the core group of them at least, you know, increasingly move further and further away from the Marxist idea of the proletariat, which is kind of a strange, you know, position to have if you're a Marxist, right? I mean, I mean, I mean, how can you understand Marxism without the proletariat? It's kind of intrinsic to it almost. Um, but that's kind of the direction that they move it, and 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 it increasingly becomes, even though he's talking about third world revolution here and things like that. When you really look at what Marcuse was about. He seems to place a lot more emphasis on the so-called intellectual class of people, the student protesters and things like that, and the people who were going to college and getting degrees and getting good jobs and things like that. He placed a lot more emphasis on those people. And if you look at, you know, in today's world now, I mean, who are the people that even read this stuff <laughs> other, other than college students that are forced to, like, like, all, like all of you? But who are the people that actually read this stuff more or less Voluntarily, it's basically yeah. Again, these these uh, you know affluent upper middle class New York liberal types who read this stuff and talk about it, you know, presumably or at least write you know books and articles about it, and 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 it represents a a trend within Marxism where it increasingly becomes more of a kind of academic affair. It increasingly becomes something that's talked about among intellectuals and academics and things like that, and moves very much away from its working class origins which I don't think is a good legacy. I mean, I mean, I mean, and I'll, I'll be honest, as a student, it, it probably didn't bother me as much, but now, you know, just looking at the way things have turned out, especially over the last, you know, 10 years or 20 years or so, you know, I mean, what, 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 what is the legacy of, you know, educated liberals, you know, as a force of social reform in this country? There, there, there has been no social reform in this country in the last 20 years, at least. And in fact, things have regressed in a lot of ways, right? The country's become more unequal. You know, many, many of the social conflicts here, social problems here have, have, have become worse in the in, in, intervening years. So I would say that the legacy of, of academics, and so-called intellectuals, intellectuals as a class of people, not, not, not intellectuals in the sense that they're smarter than everybody else, although I'm sure many of them probably think so, but intellectuals as a class of people, people who basically, you know, you use their intellect as a source of labor, you know, you know, as, as their, as their, as, as, as their labor, basically. Uh, so-called white collar workers, as opposed to blue collar workers, as, as the, the, as the distinction used to be. Um, that, that legacy has also turned into a giant failure. You know, I would say probably just as much, if not more, maybe than the third world revolutionary movements of the 1960s as, as well. And, you know, Marx wasn't necessarily working class him, himself, you know, kind of came from, a, you know, he went to school, got a college degree. His, his father, I think, was a lawyer. Engels' father was a factory owner. Engels himself was an owner of a factory. So these guys, you know, didn't necessarily come out of the working class th themselves, but they always were active within working class groups. And, and they never really gave up on that idea. And, and it's true that, you know, Marx, if you read a lot of his private correspondence, constantly expresses frustration, you know, at, 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 at you know, sort of advancing, you know, working class people or, or, or the sort of, you know, movement of working class people, but they never really gave up on it either. They always sort of stayed, stayed true to that idea. Um, the sort of latter day generation of people basically have almost completely, you know, written off the working class. I mean, Marcuse, if, if, if you read, you know, the, the whole preface here, I mean, he, he, he basically talks about organized labor unions as like they're part of the enemy now, basically. I mean, it's almost like a complete 180 as far as, you know, the, you know, position that you would expect a Marxist to have. And I'm not saying he's completely wrong either. I think that there is a lot of reasons why you can, you know, be skeptical of organized labor, of unions, particularly of the union leaders of bureaucracy. But, what, you know, what's this idea that the working class in this country have become so conservative? Is, is there actually any proof to show you that that, that impact is actually true? It's, it's constantly assumed by people, especially by these, you know, upper, upper class educated people and stuff that working class people are just a bunch of, you know, ignorant, 
reactionary moron, basically. But is there ever actually any proof that can go along with that? I'll, I'll actually try to show some in, in future classes by sort of, you know, looking at election results and things like that. I mean, I mean, there, there is maybe something that you can say to that, or at least in more recent elections, or, or, or especially of the so-called white working class. Um, but that's part of part of the problem too, is that I think like a lot of people, when they talk about working class people, it's, it's become almost a euphemism, a code word, if, if you will, for talking about white men, which is simply not, not true. I mean, at least half of the workforce is made up of women, probably more than, more than half, when, you know, especially when you consider jobs that are kind of so-called off the books, like, you know, childcare and, you know, um, thing, things like that. Um, women probably make up more than half of the workforce. And not all the workforce is white either. I mean, the, 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 there has been a significant uptake in labor strikes since about 2018 or so. I mean, look at look at photos of of these movements of of workers on on strike. It's not all white people out in in the crowd. I mean, part of this is you know the demographics of the of the country. I mean, you know, Caucasian people still make up like I think like you know sixty percent of the country as a whole. In 1980, it was like eight eighty percent of the country. Um, a lot of the workforce aren't even Amer American citizens. Yeah, I mean, we 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 were constantly exploiting you know migrant laborers or immigrant laborers. Uh, whether you know seasonally or, or people who 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 immigrate to to the country on a more permanent basis, so this sort of euphemism of of you know identifying working class people with like sort of like white men in factories is 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 kind of an out, outdated notion, and I think it's very much a distortion of of, of things. Now that being said, you know, if you look at recent elections, I mean a lot of so called white working class people did vote for Donald Trump. So I'm not saying this is totally wrong either. It's just I just think there's a more complicated story that goes along with this that has to be sort of untangled a, a little bit. Um, uh, Biden actually did somewhat better among white working class voters than Hil Hillary Clinton did. Um, on the other hand, Trump did very well among Hispanic voters. Trump got almost 30 percent of the Hispanic vote in 2016, and he got almost 40 percent of, of the vote in 2020. So that, that kind of goes against the sort of simple narrative, you know, what we can sort of, you know, base everything on, on race and ethnicity and stuff. Uh, conservatives want to kick out immigrants who pay taxes, but defend tax and draft dodgers. Um, right. Immigrant, well, they, they, they believe that immigrants don't, don't, don't pay taxes, but that's not true. That's, that's, that's part of their whole thing as well. I've heard people say that, many, oh, the, 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 they just come here and they get right on welfare. It's, it's like, do you really think it's that easy to get, you know, to get on welfare? Like, it's incredibly hard. Uh, but that's, you know, their narrative that, 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 that they have and things like that. Uh, yeah, do you have your hand up? Uh, uh, yeah, I was going to say, um, weren't a lot of the, like, the Latino um, or Latinx, I guess, uh, Trump voters, like, weren't they, like, a lot of Cubans and, like, basically like people who just were anti well i mean socialist yeah but i mean michael parenti has this like clip where basically he says like or i think it's Kwame Ture, basically like how they don't even know like you were saying before i was going to say this um you know most people don't even read marx so like but they but then they talk about communism and how bad it is and all of these things and how it'll never work but they can't even define the problem in the first place right yeah so it's like if you have an enemy, why would you want to not know how your enemy looks like or where he lives or what's his name? Yeah, well, that's a, yeah, that's a very good point. Because it's um, based out of fear. Yeah. It's based out of fear. It's, it's based out of their, you know, simplistic, you know, they, they, they'd rather believe in the boogeyman, basically, than, you know, believe in something real or like actually, yeah, try to understand how, how this thing, you know, plays out in reality. Um, yeah, I mean, Cubans, as far as I know, because many of them did come over after Castro took took power, um, do tend to be very conservative. But I don't know if that speaks, you know, to conservative, uh, you know, hit, hit, what am I trying to say? Uh, Hispanic speaking, you know, uh, conservative voters for Trump as a whole. I think it's probably a, l a little bit bigger. Than, I mean, I mean, 40 percent of the, yeah. you know, 40 percent of the votes, a pretty, pretty large amount. Um, Mexicans make up a very large, you know, probably the largest group of Hispanic voters, Puerto Ricans. I think, I think Cubans are like third or fourth or something like that. There's a, wait, oh, there's a guy uh, in my town and for the past 
when did Trump get elected? Two years ago? 2016. He's he's had a Trump flag on one side of his car and a Colombian flag. And he's just he's had it for two years on his car. Like he just drives around town. Yeah, well, I mean, it speaks to something. I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, some people argue because a lot of Spanish speaking countries tend to be very Catholic. And Catholicism tends to, you know, create more conservative values or, or, you know, people internalize more conservative values, socially conservative values, things like that. I don't know if that's a part of it. I, yeah, I, I, I think the Cuban aspect is definitely a big role, but it's probably more than that as well. But like I'm saying, it's, it's just a much more intricate, nuanced picture than just like, oh, you know, all these white working class people vote vote for Trump and, you know, everyone else is opposed to it. Now, black voters almost overwhelmingly voted for both Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden. I mean, I mean, Trump's numbers of black voters were like sing, sing, single digits, I think. Although, interestingly enough, it did go up a little bit between 2016 and 2020. If I'm, I don't have it completely you know, the, the, the I, I, I'm, not, I'm not looking at it here, but if I remember correctly, I think it was around, I think Trump got around like 6% of the black vote in 2016 and 8% in 2020. So still a very small amount, but it did kind of increase a little bit. 40% of the vote though, I mean, that's that's a pretty large amount. I mean, I mean, it's up almost 10% from the previous election. I mean, at that rate, it's not going to be long before Republicans are basically s- splitting the so-called Hispanic vote. And when, when I say, you know, the black vote or the hi- Hispanic vote, I'm just saying, you know, people do break voters down into these demographic groups and do sort of, you know, analyze and keep track of, of, of who votes for who. So, so the, the, and, and, and they tend to look at it as the sort of, you know, block of things, which, which maybe is, is not the best thing to do, but, but that is how people tend to do it. So it's, it's not, you know, at that rate, it's not going to be long before Republicans are getting like half of the Hispanic votes, and maybe even more than half, you know, in our in our lifetime, or even relatively soon. So there's a lot more, I think, that you know goes into this besides just race and ethnicity and things like that. Um, but yet, it's almost always assumed that again, white working class voters are just this you know large group of just you know racist, ignorant, you know, conservative voters, and. Especially in the 1960s, I mean, most working class voters were still voting solidly for the Democratic Party. So I'm not even sure what Marcuse is necessarily even basing that on. I mean, I mean, it's only, I think, since like the 90s that I think like a majority of white working class voters have voted for the Republican Party. So, I mean, that's like 30 years almost after Marcuse is writing this. Yet it's almost always just assume that that is the case. So. And even if it's true, again, you know, the working class is not just all white men anyway. So, you know, I, I, I think, uh, you know, what I'm getting at here, obviously, is I think like one of the ways maybe to correct on some of the flaws of, of critical theory is I think it definitely does have to be sort of brought back into a kind of working class movement. It's, it's, it's not as far as it's become sort of almost completely just an academic thing, an intellectual thing. It's been a failure. And, and if anyone really thought that intellectuals would, would be the sort of force for social change in the country, I mean, that has been a failure as well. So I think, you know, at the end of the day, the only thing you can really do is, is try to build a working class movement out of this. And I think they have a lot of insights that are important here, that their analysis of culture and things like that. I think there are very valuable insights to what they're talking about. But I think it, it, it needs to become, you know, sort of once again, a, a sort of working class movement. Uh, so this is another, so I, I probably won't even get past the, the, the preface for this class, but, you know, that's okay, because in many ways, like I said, Marcuse's work from the 1960s is even more relevant than um, this book from the 50s, which I've said several times now, I think is, you know, mostly valuable because it gives you a good sort of overview of Freud's theory, inc- including how Freud's theory sort of evolved and changed over time. Marcuse does, does give you a, a, a pretty good overview of that. Uh, but I think that the overall argument, yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, so, uh, society is not as repressed as it was in the 1950s, which is basically Marcuse's whole argument here, which even he himself says only 10 years later is, is, is basically kind of like, you know, an outdated theory in many ways. Uh, but he, he, here uh, again, he's talking about basically the, these third world countries, uh, the historical advantage of the latecomer of technical backwardness, maybe that of skipping the stage of the affluent a society, backward peoples, 
by their poverty and weakness may be forced to forgo the aggressive and wasteful use of science and technology to keep the productive apparatus a la Mazir de la Home under his control for the satisfaction and development of vital individual and collective needs. So this idea of sort of third world countries um, sort of going a different route, not, not, not following the sort of established route of capitalist development up into that point and sort of skipping the stage of capitalism going right towards, right towards socialism. Again, a theory that Lenin kind of works out. And again, a theory that's pretty much you know, explicitly rejected by Marx, who, who again, always was very you know, consistent on this idea. The society sort of have to go through the sort of capitalist stage of development before they can get to socialism. So very much a departure in many ways from, from Marxism. Now, this is written in 1966. This is the same year. And it, it's quite interesting in that re regard because it's, it's, it's the same year that the cultural re revolution begins in China. Which, if you don't know, is a you know an, an enormous event, a very uh, unusual event, let's say, um, in China during sort of the latter days of Mao's reign, um, which essentially is kind of this idea that that, that that Mao wanted to sort of change the culture of China to sort of break away from its traditional past and sort of, in his mind at least, sort of you know give power back to the common people, which were the peasants of China. And sort of, it was a sort of an anti-intellectual movement, an anti-urban movement, in many ways. It's very, you know, you know, fascinating and bizarre sort of episode of history. Um, too complex, really, to go into, you know, in that detail. I mean, many people say it was just basically Mao's attempt at sort of holding power in his own hands because he was beloved by the peasants, and sort of taking power away from the sort of bureaucratic apparatus that the Communist Party of China was becoming. Um, which kind of succeeded. I mean, if that was his intent, it, it kind of succeeded, at least in the short term, at least, at least until his death about 10 years later, 1976. Um, Cambodia, under the um, Khmer Rouge, would take this idea to even more extreme stance uh, or, or more extreme uh, uh, lengths. <laughs> and, 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 forcibly relocate, re relocate people out of, out of the cities in Cambodia and sort of bring them into the countryside and sort of, you know, cr creating this sort of peasant ag agricultural force. And an, an enormous humanitarian disaster probably killed at least half a million, if not, you know, a million people, at least in Cambodia as this process of forced relocation goes. But again, I mean, what was sort of, you know, motivated by a very kind of similar attitude, this idea that, you know, we don't have to go through this capitalist stage of development. We can kind of skip, skip over this. Again, um, I would say that that idea, you know, has proven to be a failure. And again, the, and, and, and that attempts to do so have been, you know, catastrophic and, le and led to, you know, literally millions of people dying. I mean, a lot of people died in China as well. I mean, during this. Um, this, you know, this was the era of re-education camps and again, you know, taking people out, uh, again, also taking people out of, of the cities, putting them in uh, forced labor camps, you know, um, brainwashing them, you know, over loudspeakers where they'd be working all day and out and being told, you know, how horrible they are and things like that. And they need to, you know, give up their, you know, their bourgeois ways and things like that. Now, I admit, you know, my darker moments, I think it's kind of funny to picture, you know, something like this happening to Trump's family picturing, you know, Ivanka and, and Jared, uh, what's his face, uh, you know, you know, being sent to a hard, hard labor camp out in the countryside and forced to dig, you know, turnips or something like that. But I admit that's a pretty dark impulse. And, you know, if, if, if something like that ever happened, I'm, I'm sure, you know, lots of more decent people would get caught up in it as, as well, maybe. But anyway, all jokes aside, um, I think, you know, that has proven to be, you know, not, not a uh, successful move. And I, I think, you know, what, what I'm saying here basically is, I, you know, I think the, the original sort of Marxist, you know, version of, 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 of this theory is probably more, you know, viable in these ideas that you can, you can sort of go another way. That in a sense, you do kind of have to go through the capitalist stage of development. And that's only when you've achieved that level of material abundance and productivity that then only then you know, the, does it become possible to make the uh, 
transition into socialism. Uh, all right, is it almost 1.30? What time is it? Let me check real quick. Okay, is it 1.30? I, I have clocks that say two different things. Yeah, I guess it's about 1.30. Um, all right, so we'll uh, we'll break for uh, for now, and we'll obviously pick this up on Thursday's class. We'll sort of get into a little bit more of you know the Freudian theory itself that Marcuse kind of you know lays out in, in this book. Um, all right, so if there's no other questions, then uh, I'll let you all go. Okay, all right, take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. I forgot how to stop recording. <laughs>